It's KPOI 105.9, the big kahuna, Honolulu's only classic rock. Dave Lawrence with you, the Workforce Afternoon, and glad that you're on board today. A very special guest joins us. He has an amazing career that he's going to share with us. Getting an opportunity when he was just 17 years old to record with Neil Young on 1970s After the Gold Rush. He continued to work on several other Neil Young albums and tours. He's written music with Lou Reed, toured with, and is featured on live albums and releases by Ringo Starr. He stands alongside Little Steven as a guitarist in Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band and has a new CD you've been hearing on the air and we're going to hear about today, Sacred Weapon. It has special guests including David Crosby and Graham Nash, and it is a great pleasure to welcome Nils Lofgren. Aloha, Nils. Aloha, Dave. Thanks for the great wind-up. Ah, well, I, you... I didn't realize how long I've been at it. Dude, all, all <laughs> of that is your history and it's worth sharing with people. So, Well, I, it's, uh, this month actually is... Um, 38 years on the road, so I'm glad to be alive and, and fairly sane and singing. <laughs> you have had a, an incredible run, and, and thanks uh, for, for being willing to take some time to be on my show. Absolutely. And also thanks to your friend Kirk, who lives out here, who connected us. That's how I, I, I got the, the Nils connection. Yeah, no, I thank a big shout out to Kirk. He was a dear buddy from Maryland, and him and his girl went out to Hawaii. They're having a great time there, and uh, I actually had a brief... Uh, I have one of my favorite months ever. We did a, a month of recording on the Trans album with Neil Young, uh, the 83 record that came out called Trans. We mm -hmm. took our trans band to Hawaii, and it was just beautiful. We rented a place on the ocean and went into Honolulu and recorded every day and had a ball. So I have fond memories of Hawaii. With Neil Young here. Yeah, we did. Uh, he made this beautiful record called Trans. Yep. I don't know if you remember, but this was back in the days where... You know, to me, because Neil um, and his wife Peggy have the Bridge School benefit, with which is groundbreaking for kids with severe handicaps. Yep, very and familiar with that. And using technology to, for instance, you know, build things where, like, maybe if they can't control them, their body that much, but if they can move, like, the top of a, a round surface, like it looks like the top of a bowling ball coming out of a table, they can engage a train set or, or a, a piece of art or, or something interactive, and it was... A brilliant record where Neil was actually giving these groundbreaking te technological uh, advanced machines a kind of a personality and a soul. And I just, as always, being a Neil Young fan, thought it was brilliant. And of course, the music business decided it was too un Neil Young like and unreleasable. <laughs> and uh, while he was butting heads with them, we uh, took the trans band. We were rehearsing for a, a tour in, in Europe. We went to Hawaii and we recorded a whole other kind of genre of music, just some really earthy stuff and some very advanced uh, synclavier, vocorder stuff. Anyway, about five of the things made it onto the Trans album, and we hit the road, and there's still a whole album of great music, and some of it is very, uh, I would say, island-based, that, you know, we keep hoping, because it was great stuff, will appear on one of the decade records that, you know, hopefully all that stuff will eventually come out. But we had a ball, you know, we lived on <laughs> the beach, played music all day, went into the, uh, we rehearsed for a while, and then we went into the city every day and worked in a funky uh, commercial studio. And I love being in bands, so to, to be in a great band with Neil and have a month in Hawaii was, you know, like a dream vacation, work vacation come true. Ah, listeners, I'm sure appreciate that, dude. That's a nice thing that you have that kind of local connection uh, beyond Brother Kirk. <laughs> you really Absolutely, are. Absolutely, yeah. You're you're loaded down. You're large with Oahu, Nils. So I'm uh, gonna I'm gotta get there and sing one of these days. Yeah, man. Well, that that's certainly something I was gonna be mentioning, and and just because it, it's such a curiosity, uh, and we'll get to the record in a moment. But how did you uh, go from being in your first band, Grin, and that leading you to Neil Young when you were just 17 years? old well i met neil when i was 17 and, and fast forward i did uh, we started recording <clears throat> after the gold rush when i was 18 but what happened was grin was a local favorite in washington dc doing original music and we were about to go to los angeles to look for a record deal and i had a habit of sneaking into shows and asking my heroes what was up because i <clears throat> i loved music but i knew nothing about the business I happened to sneak backstage at the cellar door and uh, start asking questions of Neil and Crazy Horse on their first tour of the U.S. And thankfully, he handed me his Martin guitar, and after letting me sing a number of songs for him, he got me a cheeseburger and Coke. And 
<laughs> got me a little table. I was underage, but uh, <clears throat> at the time, D.C. drinking age was 18. I was 17. And for two days, I watched four great shows, spent the afternoons hanging out with him. And he was a just a brilliant, inspired artist that, you know, was willing to offer some friendship my way. And he called from the road, and I told him we were headed to L.A., and he said, look me up when you get there, and I did. Long story short, his producer, David Briggs, took us under his wing, and we moved in with David. I did, and, uh, you know, we kicked around the standard ups and downs of management and bad deals and this and that, but all the time I'd see Neil regularly come and jam with Grin at the Corral. We became the house band at the Panga Canyon Corral, and, he, you know, he, him and David said we had to get a, a, a better bass player, and we did, and then as Grin started making records, even before that happened uh, a year later, you know, it was very busy, productive days, a lot of great ups and downs, and having a guy like David Briggs to be my big brother and mentor was a huge help, and having Neil there to kind of offer encouragement and advice. But anyway, uh, within the next year, he called and said he wanted me to play some piano and acoustic guitar and sing on this project called After the Gold Rush, and that was my first huge recording experience at 18 years of age, and Man. I was an old accordion player, and you know, in typical Neil fashion, you know, I got excited, and then I pretty much was horrified because he said, I think I'm going to have you play mostly piano. <laughs> and I had to be honest with somebody I really admired and say, I don't really play piano. And he was like, well, you played accordion all your life. You'll figure the piano out. <laughs> and I guess what he wanted was some very simple, basic uh, playing by someone who loved his music and was excited playing simple as opposed to a virtuoso who maybe wouldn't be... Uh, whose instincts wouldn't be to play as simply as I did. Right. So it was a great experience with David, living with him and working on that. And What cuts did you do on that? <clears throat> well, on the uh, acoustic guitar, I did um, Tell Me Why, sang the harmonies there, and uh, to, Till the Morning Comes, uh, I played acoustic guitar and sang. And then on the piano, I moved over to piano for Only Love Can Break Your Heart, mm. uh, Cripple Creek Ferry, uh, Don't Let It Bring You Down. And then Southern Man was a great piano part. Uh, during a jam one night, uh, actually one afternoon, Ralphie and I stayed, and the whole song was a halftime thing, you know, dum bum ting ka bum bum dang like that beat. Yeah. And I, we got jamming during a lunch break. Only Ralphie and I stayed on the instruments, the drummer Ralphie. And after a while, I started doing the old um, accordion polka thing, the mm pum pa dum mm pa mm pa, and we double timed it and had this great jam going and they came back from lunch and you know neil was like well what's that and i said that's your song with a polka beat that all right well that's the solo <laughs> so in the song you'll hear when we go to the solo and then again at the end of the song we kick into a double time beat and it was really exciting that you know my first corny instrument that i grew up with the classical accordion actually i came up with an arrangement idea that was useful for neil on southern man so right. It was a great experience doing the whole record. And an enduring rock anthem, too, man. Yeah, that whole album is just... Uh, it's funny, I just saw uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young last month in uh, Virginia, and they were incredible. And they actually had the After the Gold Rush piano that I played on the road, and <laughs> Neil sat down and played Only Love Can Break Your Heart, which was the piano part that I basically learned his part and played it on the album. So it was very cool to look at that old piano and... You know, it's funny, because when, when I saw it on the set list, I said, somebody better be playing that piano on it. And, of course, Neil sat down and played that beautiful part, and uh, they sang it, you know, just kind of a cappella, him on piano with Crosby and Nash singing harmonies. It was beautiful. You continue uh, to be tight with him? or? Well, I continue to be a great admirer and friend, and, you know, I got to jump on the bus and have a visit with him. And of course, we... Like most all of us in this crazy planet, we're all living our own lives with children and craziness, and I'm on the road all the time. But whenever I'm in his neck of the woods, uh, I always love sitting down and looking him in the eye and having a chat. He's been a historic person in my life and career and continues to be supportive and a, and a good friend. His wife's Peggy's fabulous, too. And they just always, you know, been in my corner, and as I have been in theirs. It's interesting that his two sometime bandmates, David Crosby and Graham Nash, show up on your new release, Sacred Weapon. Uh, in a way, it brings things full circle, sort of. Yeah, I uh, got to, again, thanks to Neil, in the late 60s, actually. Um, 
got to see Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young become a super group, and I got to know all of them, especially David and Graham were very friendly in the early days and have remained friends through the years and very supportive. And I, they played uh, without Neil last year. Crosby, Stills, and Nash did a show in Phoenix where I'm living in Scottsdale with my wife Amy and. I went to the show. They brought me out to play on For What It's Worth, and I got to trade some guitar licks with Stephen Stills, who's wow. one of the greats. And um, I, I told Graham and David I had this kind of anti-war song, a, so, a story about a soldier from, from his wife's perspective, and I'd love him to sing some harmonies, because I put some harmonies on myself that were okay, but they were kind of imitating Graham and David anyway. Hmm. So they listened to it, and fortunately they really... You know, believed in the song and loved it, and said if I could get to LA, they'd sing for me. So I got to go there with a local engineer, Jamie, who was helping me out, and had a beautiful afternoon, very relaxing in a studio. Nathaniel Kunkel, Russ Kunkel's famous drummer, his son has a beautiful studio, and he let us use it. And they sang some great harmonies on a, a song that, you know, it was an honor to, to have him. Can I play that, and then we'll Absol keep talking? Absolutely. I would love to play that and again it's it's a story about a wife so a soldier addicted to the fear and violence keeps wanting to go back to war and from the wife's perspective telling him you've done enough stay home and, and with your kid and me and fight the war here interesting nuance in the details of the lyrics and we'll hear it now it's nils lofgren of bruce springsteen's e street band and a solo current classic from his sacred weapon cd featuring david crosby and graham nash called frankie hang on on cape boy 105.9 the big kahuna Nils Lofgren of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band and a solo current classic from his Sacred Weapon CD called Frankie Hang On, featuring special guests David Crosby and Graham Nash. Here on Cape Boy 105.9, the Big Kahuna, Honolulu's only classic rock. It's Dave Lawrence, and Nils is my guest today. Thanks again for taking time to, to, uh, taking time to be here, Nils. Hey, it's my treat, Dave. I, I make music to share, and I've, you know kind of been grassroots for 12 years with a website, NilsLofgren.com, and no record company, so I'm very, very grateful uh, to be on the radio. Ah, it's, it's my pleasure, and uh, you're, uh, it's funny you mention that, because that was going to be uh, my next line of questioning for you. Uh, NilsLofgren.com. The web is sort of, it's made things, if you're a rock fan, it's added a lot of ways to get to know your favorite artist. And uh, when people hear my show, a lot of the time I think, there's some illumination in, in artists by way of the things that they put on their website. Um, and at NilsLofgren.com, you have some cool photos right there on, on the front page, including one, and in, in it's in one shot. I really like this one. It's Little Steven and Paul Rogers and yourself. <laughs> when, when was that taken? That was on the Rising Tour. Um, I got to... Paul Rogers was, I think... Well, there's no greater rock singer in history, in my opinion. There's many, there, there, there's many good singers, there's very few great singers, and Paul's has no one better. I, I've always been a fan. So, make a long story short, I <clears throat> tracked him down about 10, 11 years ago and uh, got to know him a bit. And we went and hung out in Santa Barbara and kind of played a little bit together. And I invited him to the Rising Tour uh, with uh, his fiance Cynthia, and they showed up and had a great time. And so, you know, little Stevie, me, Bruce, listen... We all grew up with the greats, and no one will deny that you know there's no better rock singer than Paul Rogers. So it was fun for Stevie to come, and I, you know, it was a great pleasure because Steve's so busy and he's got his underground garage, and it was fun because I knew he'd freak out and want to sit down and talk to Paul, and <laughs> we had a good chat before the show and got that shot. That's really cool. So you uh, and it was it, it was backstage or whatever at on on the rising yeah, tour. Yeah, I think it was on the rising tour. It might have even been Vancouver. In Paul lives up that way. And interesting enough, my uh, band in the '70s, Grin, uh, which actually was the band I was in in '68 when I met Neil, that went to L.A. We made four albums, and the fourth album is called Gone Crazy. It's a there's a strange kind of macabre artwork all over the front and back by one of my favorite artists in D.C., Lanny Tupper at the time. But it's a very obscure record, but on the back cover at the very bottom of the artwork, there's a stairwell that kind of seemingly is painted into another another dimension, mm. very small. And at the bottom is just a jumble of looks like um, unintelligible letters. But if you hold it up to a mirror, you'll notice that the letters read, Paul Rogers, number one. <laughs> and this is way back in 73, you know. So I grew up with Free. I think it's a shame they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They should be. Uh, but Free was one of the great bands growing up and still is to me. Great body of work. And 
uh, you know, having Paul, I mean, I guess a couple months ago, actually, Paul invited me as a, a guest guitarist on a couple festivals out in Japan. And I got to actually go and stand on stage with them and, you know, play songs like All Right Now and Can't Get Enough of Your Love and Bad Company. I mean, stuff that's just a real part of my musical landscape and my inspired landscape growing up. So that was a real treat. And I, you know, I treasure his friendship, and uh, he's one of the few great singers like Bruce Springsteen that uh, still have their pipes, they're still getting better, and they still take maintaining that gift very seriously and, and, and know how to use it beautifully. So it was an honor to play with him. And and the other aspect of that cool photo is that uh, Little Steven's in it. Who we we run Little Steven's show here um, on the air. And oh, that's great! I didn't know you ran the Underground Garage. Yeah, he's love we, that show. We've run it for three years. He's been my guest three times. He's on every year, and uh, I'm really tight with the guy who's like the affiliate director of that show, Mark Felsot, who I've known for a long time as well. Ironically, yeah, that's a great show. I, I Steve's kind enough to have his office send me the uh, CDs of it. Uh, so I can throw it in out and listen to it out here. It's it's just a great thing he's doing. How uh, it's what's it's it's nice to know. I'm guessing that you're pretty close with him. I mean, you have a, a it sounds like you have a really good rapport with Little Steven. Yeah, well, I used to go see the E Street Band in the '70s and '80s as a fan, and you know they knew I was this guitarist with a band making records. We grew up in the Northeast. We were on the same circuit, so there was a mutual respect. And of course, those guys went on to some mega success not only live but creatively and commercially too and i was always a fan and uh listen i <laughs> have a place dear in my heart because i've gone to see them many times in clubs and sports arenas and it, you know never would occur to me not once to be in that band and i love to be in great bands so i have to thank little steven for leaving for a few years so i could take his place <laughs> yeah I, I mean, you know, just luckily Bruce gave me the first call, and we jammed a couple of days in Jersey, and it felt right. And but I got to say that uh, Patty joined when I did too, and and Patty and I love to sing, and you know I, I've got a little more of a gentle voice. Patty can go rough or gentle. She's a fabulous singer and has made some great records. And, uh, actually, she's working on another one now, by the way. But but to have Stephen back in the band was great for the last two tours because it's kind of like. Keith Richards and Mick, they have those two rough voices, and it's a real, you know, classic rock sound that's part of the landscape, and no matter who you replace it with, I mean, you know, Mick does great solo records, I love them, and there might be another great singer with them, but it's not the same as Keith, and same thing, you know, Patty and I would sing the harmonies, and sometimes we'd sing them, well, you know, Patty'd sing the hell out of them all the time, and I held my own a bit, too, but having Steve back in the E Street Band to sing those parts and play the parts. It just made the band stronger, and we really felt to a man that the Rising Tour was our best yet because we just had, of course, new great music, and we'd all mature, but we were still, you know, kind of at our prime, and it just was a special tour, and of course, great to have Steve back. Ah, it's gigantic that you guys have that kind of rapport, and it is. It's like a family, and you've, you know, you've recorded, you've worked with Patty. Um, so it's, you know, Bruce's wife, and, and so it's really a, uh, it, it has that kind of family vibe. Can yeah, it's one of the few bands that, you know, has been around that long that, that is of that caliber and still intact. So, of course, uh, selfishly as a fan, even though there's no plans today, I got my fingers crossed that down the road Bruce might fire us up again. Nice. Well, that would be that would be cool to uh, to see. I was wondering, did Bruce ever come and check you guys out with uh, your check you out when you were in Ringo Starr's band? Um, yeah, actually, he did. I, I, of course, by that time, <clears throat> I'd uh, I, I actually owed old Bruce uh, meeting Ringo. It was on '85. We were doing three nights at Wembley Stadium in July, I believe. Um, and one night was Ringo's birthday, and uh, he invited us all through Max Weinberg because they were buddies, our drummer, to a party, and we were all thrilled. And late night after a show, ran out to a party at Ringo's house, and it was actually John Lennon's old house, the White House, Tittenhurst, with that white piano. Wow. And uh, Ringo had a recording studio, and I waited all night long to jam with him, because, I mean, hey, I, I was a classical accordion player until I heard the Beatles, and they turned me on to the world of rock and roll. So I still feel the Beatles have the greatest body of recorded music in history. So it was a thrill to play with them, and he wound up chatting late into the night after the party died down a bit, and he gave me his phone number and said, stay in touch. So I started bugging him every few weeks and just having some chats, and I go to England every year to play, and he'd start coming to see my acoustic shows, and we maintained a friendship 
that was a great honor to me. And uh, in 89, uh, it was, you know, again, it was like one of those magical moments you never expect, not unlike Neil Young calling and saying, I'd like to have you play on this project after the gold rush. And Ringo said, hey, I'm tired of be, you know, just sitting around and doing these small projects. I want to put a band together and do my first real tour since the Beatles, and I want you to be in the band. It's going to be a band of all-stars. And, you know, I... I I was just in heaven, and <clears throat> I really didn't care who was in the band. I knew Ringo was, so that was enough. And then he tells me, oh, by the way, your bandmates are going to be uh, Dr. John on piano, Billy Preston on organ, <gasps> Levon Helm and Rick Danko from the band, Jim Keltner on drums, and I'm bringing your buddy Joe Walsh on guitar and Clarence Clemens from the E Street Band for sax. And I'm saying, you got to be kidding me. Dude. And to be in a band like that for four months with Ringo as a band leader was one of the true joys of my entire career. That is, uh, and you did it like a couple, th didn't you do another gig with him too? Yeah, in 92, Joe and I were the, Joe Walsh and I were the repeat uh, members for the 92 band, the second All-Star Who band. else was in that one? Well, that was another great band. We had um, Burton Cummings on piano from the Guess Who, Todd Rundgren and Dave Edmonds on guitar, and uh, his son, Zach Starkey, played drums, which is great. Timothy B. Schmidt from the Eagles, uh, again, me and Joe Walsh, and uh, Timmy Capella, which was the great percussionist sax player from uh, Tina Turner's band and uh, we had a ball traveling around the world playing for another four months so and it was truly a democracy you know Ringo was our band leader but he wanted all of us to stand up and take the spotlight for two or three songs a night so it was a kind of a round robin just a very unusual beautiful band to be a part of and we went out and played for a while so it wasn't like a you know a charity event, a one-off, or even a weekend. We were out for four months if you, from the da time we got together to rehearse. And uh, as you can imagine, too, just I love bands. I love being in a band. I know how to be in a band. I know how to be on the road. I really thrive in the live environment. And sitting around with a couple of acoustic guitars, the vocal rehearsals in both those bands with all those voices was spectacular. So very fond memories of some great times with Ringo there. You've worked with so many people, and, and uh, i got to say, though, of all gigs you've done, <laughs> to me, the single most mind-boggling feat, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong on these the statistics, but 10 sold-out shows, Giant Stadium, New Jersey, 70,000 people per night, 700,000 tickets total. <laughs> Is that right? Well, you know, that's correct, and... <laughs> God bless Bruce Springsteen and the songs he writes. Of course, I am in the E Street Band, so I feel like I'm a little part of that. But that, that's funny you would put it that way because uh, we, were, we were just getting ready to start that run, and we were at a hotel in New York City. And, you know, Dave, I, I'm on the road all year now playing funky little clubs that I love to play for two, 300 people, riding in a little van. I'm not whining, but it's very kind of, you know, Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> and it's okay, you know, because I'm there to sing, and I love to sing and play, and I take it just as seriously as a stadium gig with Bruce. But when you tour with Bruce, first of all, I'm used to being a band leader for 38 years. Not having to be the boss every day is nice. It's nice to not be the leader all the time, and I get a different perspective musically. And, of course, with Bruce, everything's first class thanks to his massive commercial success in, in addition to the artistic success. But it's funny you'd say that that way because it reminded me one night I'm out on this, you know, night in front of the hotel on the steps, just kind of digging the air in New York City, feeling like, wow, we got this great run coming up at Giant Stadium. And who comes out of a, of a, a limo but um, Steven Tyler from uh, Aerosmith? Great band. Yeah. Great singer. So he comes up, and I guess his manager, and I, one of his roadies knew me from a tour manager, you know, we, I bumped into down the road so he introduced us and he was very friendly we started chatting a bit on the steps just kind of like yeah they were out on tour and he said hey i hear you guys um you're about to do a run at giant stadium and i said yeah yeah we're going to be there for a while and he said yeah we just uh i think we just did three nights there like a month or two ago they played three nights there and he said aren't you guys doing like you know three or four shows and i said well actually i think we're doing more than that and he was like you know really what what are you going to do like four or five nights and i looked at and i said Steven, we're, we're doing 10 sold-out nights at Giant Stadium. And he looked at me for a second, speechless. And then he just, you know, with a smile on his face, he said, F you, man. <laughs> <laughs> he just, he just, you know, I couldn't say the word. But he just, he was just staring at me. And all I could think was like, F you, man. He just laughed, and I laughed, too. I said, well, hey, man, 
I didn't write the song. I'm just playing one of the guitars. But yeah, it's it's kind of an awesome accomplishment Bruce pulled off. It was a very funny moment. I mean, it makes the uh, as a Philly <clears throat> area boy too. Uh, I mean, I know you're like a DC. You have the DC connection. I, I came right. from the Philadelphia area. It makes the ten nights at the Philly Spectrum from the mid '80s seem pretty insignificant. I gotta say, it's uh, well, and it's hard to do that, dude, because those T-shirts. People had these T-shirts. I remember back then. It had the Spectrum logo on the back of the shirt, and it right. listed all. All of the dates and I remember at that time thinking Bruce that guy is just he's unstoppable but then all those years later ten nights giant stadium 70,000 people it's like when the dead would do two nights there it was a big deal or like Steven Tyler with Aerosmith doing a, a multi-night run hey but. man you're giving me chills here that's very I mean it's it's exciting of course I'm so wrapped up in trying to deliver and try to guess what Bruce what audibles is going to pull out of the hat and what songs is going to surprise us with that it's nice to be consumed by the music but um that's that's a testament to uh to bruce springsteen he's just a very unusual talent and you know what what the real crux is is he's just one of those people that i often joke i say there's nobody out here that could be possibly having any more fun than me except maybe you and he's just one of those guys who grew up like myself that loves to be in front of an audience and there's some brilliant writers and singers that just would rather be at home, and, and Bruce is not one of them. You know, when he's in front of a crowd, it's, it's just kind of a medicinal healing opportunity for him as an individual, too, as exhausting as it is. And that's obviously why um, he's got this passion in relationship with his fans that translates into those kinds of ticket sales. Uh, they're they're off the hook, and you have an impressive career. You're a part of Bruce's magic, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to wrap up our, our interview with You're Not There from Sacred Weapon, which we've been playing, and, and I leave you with a warm invitation, Nils. If you're thinking about coming out our way, stop by my show if you're going to be in town. Love to have you in acoustic and and uh, just to chat. I'd make it really nice for you, catered gifts, and, and if you get the chance to tell the boss about us, <laughs> let him know that, uh, that we love him, we love his music and we dig him coming out to oahu too maybe even for like a for a charity or to do, do something nice for the environment i gotta tell you dave it's a regular thought it hasn't happened but we'll we'll be on a plane or something the east street band is like dang we're going through hawaii why can't we play there and it's always like oh man the equipment's on the way to australia and it's, it's just so hard to stop and do and but everyone keeps talking about wanting to get there and i'm very grateful of uh, that you're uh, letting people know about my new music and my website and I just posted my first guitar lesson, and I'm going to keep staying in touch with everyone through it, and I'm very grateful for the, the support from your station. Well, it's, uh, it's my pleasure, Nils, and NilsLofgren.com is the website. Folks can keep up with him. The legendary guitarist and songwriter and member of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band, Nils Lofgren. Thanks for being my guest today. Hey, thanks so much, Dave. How you doing, everybody? It's Nils Lofgren from the E Street Band. We're all cruising here with our dear friend Dave Lawrence. Keep on rocking.